If you would open uh, your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2, verses uh, 5 through 11, we're going to talk about the incarnation of Christ today for our Christmas message. Next week uh, will be the children's program, so uh, we can look forward to that. Philippians 2, uh, verses 5 through 11. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So uh, in this text... We have the Christmas story from the vantage point of God, uh, from His viewpoint. Very often when we think of the Christmas season, uh, this time of year, most of the preaching, most of the messages that are given to us are given from the human perspective, from the historical narrative that we see in the Gospels. Uh, We think of... uh, Joseph and Mary traveling uh, to be registered for the census. We think of there being no room in the inn. They end up in a stable. Jesus is born. There he's laid in a feeding trough. The shepherds come to worship him. And we look at the historical narrative of it all and the, the physical, the material side of things. Uh, but this text is not dealing with that. It's dealing with the spiritual, what's, what's actually taking place, the the glory of it, the majesty of it. And I would say that if all you see at Christmas is the historical narrative side, the physical side, the human perspective of things, then you miss the whole meaning of Christmas. The whole meaning of Christmas is actually found in this passage, especially in verses 6 through 8, although certainly the whole text uh, is included in it. And this is the very meaning of, of Christmas. And if we were to... If we were to just give you a brief outline of this passage, uh, in verse 6 we're going to see that Christ is truly God. In verse 7 we're going to see that Christ who is truly God becomes truly man. So that in verse 8 he may die the death of the cross so that he may be exalted And given a name above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That he would ultimately become Lord of all. Whether you be in heaven, on earth, or under the earth, everyone will confess him as Lord. And that's basically a summary or a summation of this passage that he who is God in verse 6 is Lord of all in verses 9 through 11. So as we uh, we dig in here, we're looking first, I want to uh, bring to your attention in verse 5, just for the sake of context here, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. I want us to understand, first of all, that actually what he is doing here is he is giving to us Jesus Christ as in an example of the way he wants us to be. He wants us to think like Jesus. He wants us to develop the attitude of Jesus. We're going to find out that that attitude is conveyed through words such as humility, obedience, emptying himself, 
And he's, he's challenging us to take on that very mind, the mind that is in Christ Jesus. So what we're doing here is we're simply reflecting because now he's going to turn to Christ Jesus and he's going to talk about Christ Jesus through verses 6 through 11. And, he, and so all he's doing is he's having us observe the person of Christ, who he is, what he has done. Uh, this is, uh, if you would, in theology, this is Christology. This is the understanding of the person and work of Christ. This passage is so important to us as Christians that if you don't believe these things, you are not a Christian. This is Christian orthodoxy. This is a must. This is, these are things that you cannot disagree with and remain a Christian. This is essential to the Christian faith. This is a Christological statement given to us by the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit. So he's going to turn our attention, attention to Christ Jesus. And I want you to notice what he says about Christ in verse 6. Who, of course, who is referring back to Christ Jesus in verse 5. Who being in the form of God... Let's just take up those words to begin with. Christ being in the form of God. This phrase here, being in the form, the word form is the Greek word morphe. And morphe is referring to the internal nature of someone that is unchangeable. It is referring to the characteristics and attributes of an individual. So simply what he is saying to us right here in the very beginning of verse 6 is that Christ Jesus in his being is God. And as God in his form, he bears the attributes and characteristics of God. In other words, all he is simply saying is he is in the morphe of God. He has the characteristics, the attributes, the inner unchanging nature of God in his person. That's who this is. Jesus didn't begin in the, uh, in the virgin birth. That's not the beginning of Christ. He's pointing to the pre-existence of Christ, that Christ has always been. And the way that He has always been, He has always been in the form of God, in the morphe of God, in the nature of God. The unchanging, abiding nature of God, bearing the characteristics and attributes of God. That's who Christ Jesus is. And that is why when you get to... uh, Uh, Let's just use Isaiah as one example. The prophet Isaiah in prophesying about the Messiah, about this uh, sign that the Lord would give that a virgin would would conceive a son and give birth and they will call his name Emmanuel, which means what? God with us, right? That's the whole point is that he is Emmanuel, He is God with us. He's not just a man. He is God. And He is God who is now with us. He's made flesh in the incarnation. It is why uh, Jesus in John 8 verse 58 says to a group of Jewish people who believed in Him, which I find fascinating, uh, these people... Uh, believed in him. And one of the things he says to me says, before Abraham was, I am. Uh, He is pointing to the fact that he existed before Abraham ever was. You know, and Abraham was 2,000 years earlier. Before Abraham was, I am. Of course, I am is uh, the name for God that God himself gave to Moses in Exodus chapter 3 when Moses said, when I go back to deliver your people and they ask me, what's his name? What am I going to tell them? And God says to him, tell them I am who I am. In other words, uh, he's not who I used to be or what I was or what I will one day be. I am who I am. This is me. This is, I'm the self-existent, self-sustaining one. I have no beginning. I have no end. I just am. This is me. So tell them I am sent you. And that's what Jesus is referring back to in John 8, 58. 
He's simply saying, I am, I am. I, I am the I am. I am the self-existent, self-sustaining one with no beginning, with no end. I didn't start in Luke 2 uh, or Matthew chapter 1. I started with no start, right? I, I have no beginning. I, I have no end. I am the beginning. I am the end. I am the I am. The self-existent one, he's pointing to his deity that he is in the form of God. He goes on from there, uh, and, he, and he, he's now going to give us the mind of Christ, because he's telling us to let this mind be new, which was also in Christ Jesus. And he's specifically telling us n n what, what Christ did not think, or what he did not consider. Did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Now, the word robbery here is interesting. Uh, the word uh, means here to seize something by force. It means to snatch. It can also mean, uh, you know, kind of the opposite of that. It can mean to hold on to something, to grip it tightly so as to not let it go. And I think it's right to say that both meanings are correct. I don't think it's an either-or argument that some make. I think it's a both-and argument. The word, that's why it's translated robbery in the King James, the New King James, because Christ, as God, did not have to seize. He didn't have to snatch. He didn't have to take equality with God, because why? He's already God. He's already in a place of equality with God, so he doesn't have to snatch it as though it's not his. It's already his. He's already equal with God because he already has the attributes, the characteristics, the inner nature of God that's unchanging, so he doesn't feel the need to snatch something, to rob it, if you will. But at the same time, Equally true is the fact that he didn't feel the need to grasp it and cling it so that not to let it go. You know, if you might, you might have the image of a you know, football player grabbing hold of the football and he's not going to let it go. He's not going to let anyone strip it from him. That, that, that's kind of the image here as well. He's saying he's not doing that either. Why? Because he can't cease to be God. He, he can't terminate his, 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 his Godhead position. He, he can't terminate who he is as God, so he's not afraid, if you will, in a sense, to let it go because he can't lose it. He can't cease to be it. It's not something that's going to dissipate and disappear. And so both are true. He's not trying to take something that's not his, and at the same time, he's not afraid to lose it because he can't lose it. He will always be God. And that is the point of what he is saying. He says... I'm equal with God. I, I don't have to seize it. Right? Lucifer tried to seize it. He said in uh, five times in Isaiah 14, I will, I will, I will. He, 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 one of the statements he said, I will be like the Most High. Uh, and then as the serpent, he, he was in his deception to Eve. He, he tells Eve that you will be like God. Right? What are they trying to do? They're trying to seize something that is not theirs. They're trying to snatch something that is not theirs. Not so with Christ. He doesn't have to seize or snatch. It's already His. Verse 7, this, this consideration of what he didn't consider results in an action. So this is what he, Christ, as God does. Okay? You following me? This is what Christ as God does. Now that we understand his mind and his thinking, this is what he actually does. But made himself of no reputation. Now, we'll take up this phrase here. Uh, it could be uh, in the margin of my Bible, and it's very helpful here. It gives you the literal rendering of this phrase here, but made himself of no reputation. Uh, it says that he emptied himself. He emptied himself. So now the question, and this is the $64 million question, right? What did he empty himself of? That, that becomes the question, and we're going to answer that in just a moment. 
What did he empty himself of? Well, we know he can't empty himself of deity. We've already established that in verse 6. Uh, it's part of his unchanging internal nature that these attributes and characteristics cannot be taken away from him. He's equal with God because he is God and that can't be changed. So he didn't lay aside deity. He didn't, he didn't step out of becoming God to become a man. But he laid something aside. He emptied himself of something. It literally means to pour out into nothingness. Uh, pour out to be nothing. Well, what, what is it that he poured out? Well, we're going to answer this because I think Jesus, first of all, gives us uh, an extremely, um, extremely clear definition of what it is that he laid aside. In John 17, verse 5, he says these words. You don't have to necessarily turn to these. I'm going to be flying through a bunch of scriptures here in just a moment. You're welcome to join me and follow me if you want. Otherwise, take notes. This is Jesus in prayer to the Father. And this is what he says to the Father uh, in this prayer in John 17, verse 5. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, uh, literally alongside of you. And he, and he says, with what? With the glory which I had with you before the world was. Now, there's two things here that you can see in this text from the words of Jesus himself. Number one, he is indicating his, his pre-existence with the Father before the world was, right? Why? Well, he's the creator of heaven and earth. And we know this from Scripture. John chapter 1, verse 1. Colossians chapter 1 teaches the same thing. He is the creator. He is before the world was. So it's his pre-existence as God. But then he also says something that clues us in as to what it is he laid aside because he says he doesn't have the glory that he once had when he was with the Father before the world was. So what he set aside is his glory. He set aside his privileges, his rights, and we're going to prove this to you by Scripture in just a moment. He laid aside his privileges, his rights, his prerogatives to act as God. He didn't cease to be God, but laid aside his privileges, his rights, his prerogatives to act as God in the incarnation. And that's what he's talking about here. Another example of this uh, and then we're going to go to Luke in just a moment. But another example of this is in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, where Paul is talking about an offering. Uh, but as always, in the teachings of the Scriptures, he always goes back to Christ as being the example. And what he says to them in 2 Corinthians 8 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, hear these words, that though he was rich... Yet for your sakes, he became poor. What does that mean? Well, obviously in eternity past, before the world was, Jesus enjoyed the full glory of his position in the Godhead, uh, the, the fullness of his power and knowledge and wisdom and everything else. He enjoyed the fullness of his glory at that time. And, and, and he left that to come to earth to... I mean, think about his very beginning, his first day uh, on planet earth, and he's sleeping in a feeding trough for animals. That's a long way from the throne room. Surrounded by animals in a feeding trough from the glories of heaven. It, it indicates how far down, how much he emptied himself, if you will. He became poor. He left the riches of heaven, left the riches of his position and became poor. Now what I'm going to do, and, and the only reason I'm doing it this way is because it is easier uh, to do it this way. Um, there's a myriad of examples that we could point to throughout the four Gospels. Uh, to point to this emptying of himself and what it means that he took on human flesh and laid aside these privileges, these rights to act as God. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go to Luke. 
uh, chapter 2, 3, and 4. And I'm going to give you, I think it's like seven or eight examples given to us in Luke chapter 2 through 4 to illustrate this truth to us and then we'll make a conclusion about it and move on. In Luke chapter 2, well actually before we go to Luke 2, I'm going to read Luke 1. And there's a reason I'm doing this, uh, because Luke 1 verse 80 is talking about John the Baptist. And I just want you to hear the language he uses, because he's going to use the same language when he talks about Jesus in, in another chapter. So the child grew, talking about John the Baptist, and became strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his manifestation to Israel. So the notice the child grew and became strong in spirit. We're going to see that again later when talking about Jesus. So we go to Luke 2, watch this, verse 7. This is the, the birth of Jesus. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in, a swaddle, in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Question, does God need to be born? No. Does not need to be born. He doesn't need any swaddling cloths. He doesn't need a manger. He doesn't need any of these things. God doesn't need to be born. You go on from there in the same chapter, uh, verses 22 through 24. I'm not going to read it. But this is the uh, Joseph and Mary presenting the Lord uh, in the temple and being dedicated to the Lord. Does God need to be dedicated? No, right? Same chapter, Luke chapter 2, verse 40. Uh, here you're going to see the same words that was used about John the Baptist. And the child, this is Jesus now, grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Well, again, does God need to grow? No. Does God need to become strong in spirit, or, or is he already strong in spirit? He's already strong. He doesn't need to become strong. Does God need to be filled with wisdom? No, He is wisdom, right? Uh, verse 52, same chapter. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Well, again, does God need to learn something? No, but Jesus did. He learned. He increased in wisdom. God doesn't need to learn anything. God doesn't need to increase in favor with God and with men. It's not something that God needs to do. You get to Luke chapter 3, and Jesus is going to be baptized. Uh, uh, John, or Luke 3, verses 21 through 22. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. Does God need to be baptized? No, He doesn't. And while He prayed, does God need to pray? No, He doesn't need to pray. The heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon Him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, and you I am well pleased. Does God need the Holy Spirit to descend upon Him? No. He begins his ministry. Then you go into Luke chapter 4. Here's another example, verse 1. Then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit. Does God need to be filled with the Holy Spirit? No. Returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit. Does God need to be led by the Spirit? Come on, folks. No, not at all. Into the wilderness. Verse 2, here's another point. Being tempted for 40 days. Well, James 1.13 tells us that God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does He Himself tempt anyone. So, can God be tempted? No. no. All right. He, and then it goes on, and in those days he ate nothing, and afterward when they had ended, he was hungry. Does God get hungry? No. Right, we could go on to other examples where Jesus got weary from his journey, and John chapter 4 sat down, the woman at the well gets him some water, right? That whole dialogue. Does God get tired? No, he neither sleeps nor slumbers. God doesn't get tired. And then you go on down and it says in verse number uh, 14, Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. Does God need to return in the power of the Spirit? No. He doesn't need any empowerment. He's self-empowered. 
And then you get to uh, the cl- conclusionary one that I want to get to is Luke chapter 4, verse uh, uh, 18, 19 through, t- well, actually 18 through 21. This is Jesus in the synagogue in Nazareth. He's handed the book of Isaiah the prophet. He stands up to read. He founds, finds the place where it's written. This is Isaiah 61, verse 1. Uh, going into verse 2, and then he stops abruptly in reading it. Um, And this is what he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, sat down, and the eyes of all those of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, I am Isaiah 61. That's me. Question, does God need the Spirit of the Lord to come upon him, to anoint him, to heal, and to work miracles, and to preach the gospel? No. No. God doesn't need to be anointed. Right? We, we, you, you could go to uh, you know, one of the most famous sermons in the Bible, Acts chapter 10, verse 38. And Peter says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Does God need to be anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power? No. And why did he do it? He says, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. He tells you why it is that Jesus was able to do what he did, the healings, the miracles that he wrought, why he was able to do those things. He says, God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power. And that's why he went about, went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. Interestingly, he calls sickness and disease oppression from the devil, not a blessing from God. So if you're wondering why we pray for people to be healed, it's because sickness is not a blessing from God. That's why. He went about healing all were who oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Well, again, does God need God to be with God? Right? You, you get my understanding, right? This, he, he's talking about what he has laid aside. Now, now think about the non-communicable traits of God. Self-existence. God needs nothing. He needs no one. He needs nothing to sustain Him, nothing to keep Him. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need this earth. He doesn't need this world. He doesn't need oxygen. He doesn't need anything. He's self-existent, self-sustaining, self-preserving. But Jesus in the incarnation, is He self-existing? Did He not need Joseph and Mary to care for Him as a baby? Could he have survived on his own if they would have just left him there in the manger and left him there and walked away? Would he have survived on his own? No! He needed a mother and a father to provide and to care and to sustain him throughout, throughout his childhood until he was grown enough to be able to take care of himself. He was a human in every respect except for sin, including that. He was no longer self existent He laid that aside. Jesus in the incarnation, was he, uh, was he everywhere present? We call it omnipresent. That's one of the, in, uh, the, the traits of God that's incommunicable to us, not shared with us. It, was he in the incarnation? Was he everywhere at once? Easy answer, right? No, of course not. If he was preaching in Jerusalem, he was not preaching in Bethlehem. If he was ministering to us this morning, he wouldn't be ministering to another congregation. He was in one place at one time under the confines of time and space, just as we are. He shared in the limitations of humanity in that he could only be in one place at one time ministering to one group of people at any given time. He was no longer omnipresent. In the incarnation, did Jesus know everything? The answer is no. We just read that He grew in wisdom. Well, if you grow in wisdom, that means you lacked wisdom and you gained wisdom. We, we, we know from Scripture that when talking about His return, the second coming, uh, He says that no one knows the day or the hour. And he goes on to clarify, not the angels, 
nor the Son, but only the Father. Notice, he says, I I don't even know when I'm coming back. The angels in heaven don't know when I'm coming back. Only the Father knows when I'm coming back. See, he he was no longer all-knowing of all things. So he's not all-powerful, all-knowing. He's not everywhere present. He's not self-sustaining in the incarnation. He lays aside, he empties himself of these privileges, of these prerogatives, of these rights to act as God. We go back here to Philippians chapter 2, and he continues with this statement The very next words after he says, uh, but made himself of no reputation, or again, he emptied himself. What did he empty himself of? The prerogatives, the rights uh, that he had as deity. And he does something. He empties himself. You might say it this way in the answering of that question. uh, He empties himself by taking on something. And that's really what we were learning in Luke chapter 2, 3, and 4. And using those different examples, he emptied himself by taking on something that he wasn't. He took on himself, notice this, the words, the form of a bond servant. The word form here is again the word morphe. It's the same word we found in verse 6 that he's in the form of God. Now follow me. Verse 6 is saying he's truly God. Verse 7 is saying he's truly man. He's in the form of a bondservant, Morphe. It's his nature now. It's it's what he became in the incarnation. Uh, He's truly a servant, right? Uh, We think about um, Isaiah the prophet, uh, the four servant songs or the four servant poems. Poems in which uh, Isaiah speaks of the Messiah as being the servant of the Lord. And that's, that's who he is. He's a servant. He's the slave of the Lord, if you will. And, and we know in, in the incarnation, he says, uh, uh, Matthew 20, verse 28, he says, uh, the, referring to himself, the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give himself a ransom for many. So he is the servant of the Lord, and he is, by using the word morphe, like he did in verse 6, he's just simply saying he really is a man. He really is the servant of the Lord. He, he really is this. It's, it's not make-believe. It's not pretentious. It's not a masquerade. It's not just an outfit that he put on for 30-some-odd years. No, he really became a man. He, he really became the servant of the Lord. It's who he is. So this God becomes a man while retaining being God. (laughs) Before Abraham was, I am. He goes on from there. So by taking, so he's telling us how this emptying occurred. He took on something he wasn't. He took on this bond servant, being the servant of the Lord. And I love this, and coming in the likeness of men. I looked up some other translations on this in the English. My favorite one uh, that to me grabs the meaning of the text is being made or being born. Some will say being born, like NASB is one that says being born. The NASB 95 version says being made. Now follow me. In Genesis 1... God makes man in the likeness of God. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 7, God makes himself in the likeness of men. Glory to God. He makes himself in the likeness of men. He who made men in the likeness of God now makes himself in the likeness of men. And we should should state for sake of clarity that in this incarnation, being in the likeness of men, the word likeness here, the first part of it, it's a compound word, is the word homo, meaning the same, right? It's the same, the same as man. And we we should state 
that what he took on in himself, except for sin, apart from sin, separate from sin, right? But separate from sin, everything else was a post-fall body. What do you mean by a post-fall body? Hungry, tired, um, subject to persecution, sorrow, weeping, discouragement, anger, right? He gets angry, flips over tables, has a whip in his hand, <laughs> angry, right? Adam would have never experienced that in the pre-fall state. It's post -fall. The fact that he was able to be um, punished unto the death, pre-fall body doesn't die. Post-fall body, sin out of this world and death through sin, right? He's, he's in a post-fall body. He's, so he's experiencing the, the same appetites of, that, that you have, the same uh, experiences that you have apart from sin again. He goes on from there, and he says, verse 8, and, being, and we're almost done, "...in being found in appearance as a man." And the word appearance here is, is different than form. Morphe, which is talking about the nature that's unchangeable, that's internal. This word here, uh, appearance, schema, means this. It's talking about the, uh, the external appearance, just as it would suggest from the word here, right? Appearance. It's talking about the external, that which is uh, subject to change, the appearance of someone. Uh, in other words, to explain the difference between, and what he's trying to say to us here, the difference between morphe and schema, between form and appearance, is this, is, let me illustrate it to you this way, I'm a man. From the moment of conception, I was a man. All the way to the tomb, I will always be a man. That's my morphe, that's my nature, that's my characteristics, my attributes is always that. It's fixed, it's unchanging. But my schema, my appearance, changes over the years. I go from a baby through childhood, adolescence, into being a teenager, a young man, into being a man in the prime of his life. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a joke. I don't know if I'm in the prime of my life or not. I hope not. And then one day I'll be an old man. But the whole idea is, in all those stages, I'm always a man. It never changes. My nature doesn't change. It's just my schema, my appearance changes. And that's, that's what he's saying here about Jesus. Jesus never changes. He's always God, verse 6, yet he's always man, verse 7. But his, his appearance has changed. He goes from, from, from birth and through the child and teenage years to adulthood. But he remains in this form of God and also the form of man. The God-man. 100% God, 100% man. It's beautiful. We're almost there. Notice what he does as a man. What does, what's the next word say in verse uh, 8 after it says, and being found? Let, let me back up. Let me say one other thing real quick. In other words, what he's getting at here in the first part of verse 8 is this. If you saw Jesus, you would assume he's a man. He appeared like a man. You would think he's a man. And not just a man, a very common man, a very ordinary man. Right? Um, Isaiah 53, verses uh, 2 and 3, he says um, that he has no form or calmness about him. And, and he goes on. This is exactly how he says it in Isaiah. And when we see him, right, appearance, when we see him, there's no beauty in him that we should desire him. He was very common, very ordinary. That's why it goes on to say that he was despised and rejected by men. Right? There's no glow. There's no aura. There's no halo around his head. There's no brightness of his face. He's just an ordinary man. He's the son of a carpenter and a homemaker. He learns the family business and takes up the family trade. There's nothing about him that you're going to look at him and say, That's God! So he's in this appearance as a man, and what does he do as a man? He humbled himself. As God, verse 6, verse 7, he emptied himself. 
As a man, what does he do? Humbles himself. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, right? What, what mind? Empty yourself. Humble yourself. Be, be like the Savior who saved you. Don't be this self-exalting, self-promoting, egotistical, the world's about me. Don't focus so much on yourself and pride and self-exaltation. Empty yourself. Humble yourself. Right? This, is, this is really what he's trying to get at, but he's using this great Christological statement in conveying that truth to us. He humbled himself as a man. So much so that he became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. I love that. Even the death of the cross. Two things, and then we're going to close in verses 9 through 11 real quickly. Two things. Even the death of the cross. We must remember two things. Number one, the greatest suffering of Christ on the cross was not the nails, it wasn't the thorns, it wasn't uh, the fact that he had been beaten beforehand, it wasn't uh, being mocked by the crowds and, and, and all of that, it wasn't the unjust trial, it was the fact that he was made sin with our sin and that he bore the wrath of God for our sin. He bore the sin of every single person who would ever believe in him at one moment in time, and bore God's wrath. No wonder why he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was forsaken of God on the cross. He was cursed. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For as it is written, Cursed is every man that hangs on a tree. He was cursed for us. And at the same time, in the Roman world, the crucifixion was something reserved for non-Roman citizens and the worst of criminals. It was, it, was, it, was, it, was a, it was a horrible, detestable, cruel death. Hanging a man naked before the world. It was a cruel death, and yet Jesus humbled himself. How far did Jesus empty himself as God? How far did he humble himself as a man to the point of death? And therefore, now this is God's response to all of this. This is phenomenal, and this, is, this will be real quick. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In other words, God's response to this sacrifice, to this humility, is that he exalted Jesus so high that he actually gave him a position that he did not enjoy before. And there's three points to make in that, and I'll just throw them out to you real quickly. Because he became a man, because he humbled himself to the point of death, because he was able to identify with us in humanity, he has become our high priest, he has become our advocate, and he has become our intercessor. Because of, of, of what Jesus did for us, He is the only substitute for our sins. No other. He's exclusive. There's only one, one way of salvation. Only one who bore our sins on the tree. And think of it. He is the only way of salvation for every person that has ever been born or will ever be born on this planet. He is the only way of salvation. So God has exalted him to this position that he never had before, right? He, he didn't have that before. Now he has this position now, and the requirement that is given to angels, to Satan, to fallen angels, to demons, to, to us to unredeemed, unsaved humanity, to those in hell, to those on earth, and to those in heaven, to everybody, 
is that one day every single solitary knee is going to bow and every single solitary tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is I am. He is Yahweh. Amen. God, who existed throughout all eternity, became a man. To the end that He would die on a cross, that He would be exalted and that all would say one day that He is Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for the meaning of Christmas. This is the true meaning of Christmas. Help us not to get lost in you know, all the things. that They're beautiful, they're pretty, they're, they're nice things. I'm not saying they're bad things necessarily. But help us not to get caught up in that, uh, in, or, or even just the historical narrative of, of the, uh, uh, the, the stable scene, the manger scene, and all of that. And all, although those things are wonderful in their place, but help us to see the true meaning of Christmas and see this text for what it is and the rich truth that it brings out. And uh, help us uh, to have a greater appreciation of you and what you have done for us. Uh, in and through the Incarnation. Thank you, Father, for this in Jesus' name. Amen.